Today on Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. Remember, the amount of work accomplished is not as important as the spirit in which it is done. Was Peter serving the Lord only for what he could get out of it? Peter was a little too quick, wasn't he, maybe, to jump in? Hey, he didn't do what you asked him to do, but we did. In one sense, there's nothing wrong with that again. But it could be wrong if the intent is divorced from and disconnected from God's glory, love for Christ, a marveling simply at the gift of grace. Are you serving God with a spiritual calculator in hand? Today on Know the Truth, Philip continues his exploration of Jesus' parable of the workers in the vineyard. We're discovering the dangers of a calculating spirit in serving God and learning why trusting the Master's generosity leads to true joy. It's a challenging message about motives in God's kingdom, and it's titled, More Than Compensated. You'll find this complete message and more on the KTT app and online at ktt.org. Here's Philip DeCourcy with today's lesson. The Christian is a person who happily sacrifices their all for God's glory, to quote John Calvin, in the belief that they serve him who never fails to reward his servants to the full extent. And so with that in mind, I want to turn to Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 to 16, where we find a parable of Jesus addressing kingdom compensation. Three things if you're taking notes. First of all, the prologue, the parable, the principles. The preceding events of the rich young ruler, Jesus' response to the rich young ruler's response, and Peter's response to Jesus' words, that's the context. And a chapter division throws us off. Remember how Jesus had probed the the heart and intent of the rich young ruler regarding the desire for eternal life. While looking at the rich man in this life, he looks like he's first. In the life to come, he will be last. Look out for the danger of being a temporary winner. Remember, the first will be last and the last will be first. The winners in this life will be the losers in the next, and the seeming losers in this life will be the winners in the next. That's the prologue the parable. And and given the chapter division and the prologue of, of the issue of rewards, now that becomes the interpretive key for the parable. What is the parable about? I'll make an argument. The parable is about rewards, because that's the context. That's the question that Jesus answers, which leads to a parable from the mouth of the Master. So, let's look at the parable and, and, and what it might mean or, or, or what it, it intends to, to communicate. The setting is a typical scene in the first century Israel. Day laborers gather in the marketplace hoping someone will offer them employment for the day. They live from hand to mouth, from day to day. And so there's a group of men standing at the marketplace uh, wishing to be um, hired just as um, there's a lot at stake for the laborers, there's a lot at stake for the landowner because he's got to get his harvest in. You know, missteps here could cost him the season, which put his family in financial peril. And so he goes down and, and he starts to, to hire. Um, the first wave at six, they're contract workers. They agreed to a denarius. It's fair. It's the going wage everybody's good. Then he gets this second wave of workers, and you'll read in verse 4 that there's no contract. He just says, hey, you need to come with me. You need to trust me, and, and, and you know, whatever is right, we'll sort it out at the end of the day. And, and they agree to that, and then this is repeated. Nine o'clock, twelve o'clock, three o'clock, five o'clock. And then at the end of the day, as you read this story, he gets his foreman to pay the workers. 
And he kind of does it in reverse, which I find very interesting. And he, tell, he, he pays those first to come in last. To their surprise, they get a denarius. Even those who came in the 11th hour who did one hour's work, they get a denarius. And, and so do those who came at 5 and 3 and 12 and 9. Now, by this stage, in the one sense, those who came at 9 who signed the contract, they're a little disturbed, but also maybe they're, they're wetting their lips in anticipation. Hey, if they got a denarius for less work in, in less time than, than we did, I guess, you know, we're going to get more doesn't work out that way. They get a denarius, just as they agreed to. There's a dispute uh, that's unfolding here. What do you mean? We're, we're getting the same as the guys who worked one hour? That's not fair. Something wrong here. And what, what does the owner say? Hold on a minute, guys. You're charging me with unfairness, but there's nothing unfair with what I did. Because number one, didn't you agree to a denarius? And number two, it's my money and I can do with it what I want. My money. And if, if you've agreed to a denarius and I give you a denarius, I'm good, you're good. Go your way. And if I want to be generous for my reasons to those who came later in the day, that's up to me. You don't get the question, my goodness or my generosity. That's the parable. And, and, and I think the issue is the issue of spirit and heart because they become discontent and complaining when they had no grounds to. And, and, and I think, again, I, I hope I'm not over-reading the text or reading into the text in a, in, in a, in a, a, a bad manner, but it is interesting that, you know, he starts with those who were last rather than those who were first. Because think about this. If those who were hired at six o'clock had been paid right away, they'd have had no complaints. They wouldn't have seen the others getting the denarius, and they would have gone home happy as Larry. But, but I think the, the intent of the, the, the parable is to challenge motive, intent, spirit, heart. Can they rejoice in the benefit of others? Can they be happy with what they have been given by the master that's both right to him and nothing unfair about it? They don't deserve anything more than they agreed to. There, there have been different interpretations on this parable. What are you to make of it? I think I've already given my hand away, but let me kind of drill down for a little bit, and then we'll get quickly to three quick, but, but I think punchy applications. I, I was surprised in reading many commentators and books on the parables that some see this parable as regarding the grace of salvation. And they think the whole point of the story is that grace seems unfair and indiscriminate. Well, first of all, that is true. Grace is indiscriminate. God is sovereign in the choices He makes in salvation. It's, it's a true statement. It's just the wrong passage. Because um, for one thing, you don't work for salvation ever. For by grace we saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. To try and climb your way to heaven, my friend, through good works, John Whitfield says, like trying to climb a sand rope. First, and another thing, I can't imagine anybody begrudging someone the gift of salvation. And for another thing, the context, I've made the argument, I think soundly, is reward. So, so number one, I don't see this as a parable regarding the grace of salvation. Number two, some believe that it teaches that everybody's going to receive the same reward in heaven, just as everybody received the denarius. Well, no, sorry. I'm in a very disagreeable mood today. The first view's wrong, and the second view's wrong. Because that flies in the face of what we read in the New Testament, that while there are degrees of punishment in hell, we covered this in our prophecy series, there are degrees of glory in heaven. 1 Corinthians 3, 14 to 15, about the judgment seat of Christ. Some will suffer loss. 
It's not the same. It, 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 it can't be the same. Isn't that what Randy Alcorn's getting at when he says, will God make all souls equal in heaven and thereby consider as equally valid a life of selfishness and indifference to others? needs as compared to a life kneeling in prayer, feeding the hungry and sharing the gospel? The Bible clearly answers no. Second John 8 says that we, we are to make sure we don't fall short of our full reward. Revelation twenty two twelve tells us that Jesus is coming quickly and his reward is with him to give, listen, to every man the same, no, to every man according to his works. So, so the third perspective is, 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 I think, the crack one. The focus of the message and the parable is attitude, heart orientation, and right spirit. Personally, it speaks of the attitude one brings to one's action. And one of the things we're going to be judged about at the judgment seat of Christ is the kind of work, not just the work, but the, the heart, the spirit, the intent behind it. What manner is it or what kind is it? 1 Corinthians three thirteen. He can do the right thing the wrong way with the wrong attitude. The kingdom of God must never be simply about punching the clock and getting paid. It's bigger than that. It's about God's glory. It's about love for Jesus. It's about helping others. Certainly the byproduct of that, the outcome of that, is reward for you. But I think Jesus is picking up on Peter's attitude here. He's a little concerned, or maybe he's just using Peter's question to, to, to warn Peter and the disciples and all of us who know that there are rewards to be gained in heaven. What's your motive? What's your intent? What's your attitude? Are, 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 you, just, are, you, are you going to be happy to accept what God gives you? Uh, you know, are, 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 are you going to fight with God? Should He bless another in a manner that doesn't meet with your approval? Remember, the amount of work accomplished is not as important as the spirit in which it is done. Was Peter serving the Lord only for what he could get out of it? I'm not saying he was. I'm just saying that's a danger. I think Jesus is picking up on that danger. Peter was a little too quick, wasn't he, maybe, to jump in? Hey, he didn't do what you asked him to do, but we did. So, Lord, what are we getting? Remember, emphatic in the Greek, that's the big thing on Peter's heart. What are we getting? What's coming to us? What are we going to have? In one sense, there's nothing wrong with that again. But it could be wrong if the intent is divorced from and disconnected from God's glory, love for Christ, a marveling simply at the gift of grace and God's blessing on others, Were the disciples forsaking all only because he had promised them a reward? This takes you back to a very central question that makes us vulnerable. Remember the charge that Satan made of Job? Oh, does he serve you for nothing? It's like Satan saying to the Lord, hey, I I think I know your servant Job better than you know him because you have blessed him. And he's living between the hedges of your protection. But I can guarantee you, you let me run, take a run at him, and he'll curse you if he gets sick, if he loses his goods, if he has some setbacks, because his motive's wrong. It's self serving, not God glorifying. And in God's providence, he allows Satan to take a run at his servant. And to Job's credit, he proves to be the man. The Bible describes him to be a man without fault. And while his wife encourages him to curse God, he doesn't. The Lord gives. The Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Attitude's important, guys. Spirit's important. Isaac Watts, the famous hymn writer, said this, it is not enough for the eye to be lifted up to him or the knee to bow before him. It is not enough for the tongue to speak of him or the hand to act for his interest in the world. All this may be done by a painted hypocrite whose religion is all disguise and vanity, but the heart with all the inward powers and passions must be devoted to him in the first place. This is religion. Indeed, the great God values not the service of man if the heart be not in it. 
Just back from London, as you know, and while we were there, uh, Kurt Driscoll, one of the men in our church, was with me on that trip. He uh, uh, went away for the afternoon and came back and told us about uh, his visit to um, St. Paul's Cathedral which had been rebuilt by Christopher Wren, a great architect after the, the fire of uh, 1666. And, and he told us about a, a, an inscription in, in the cathedral about Christopher Wren, that there is no monument to him because the cathedral is his monument. It's a wonderful little insight. But as he told me that when he got back later in the day, I said, that, that reminds me of a Christopher Wren story that as they were rebuilding St. Paul's Cathedral, um, Christopher Wren, the architect, was, must be doing a site or spot inspection. And uh, he, he ended up talking to one bricklayer and he said, what are you doing? To which the bricklayer replied, I'm, I'm a bricklayer. I'm, 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 I'm working hard at, at laying bricks to feed my family. He asked the second bricklayer, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm a builder and I'm building a, a great cathedral. He asked the third bricklayer, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm a cathedral builder and I'm building a great cathedral to the glory of God. Motive, intent. So that's the prologue. That's the parable. In a few minutes uh, here, about 15, we'll, uh, we'll look at three dangers. I think Jesus, remember, he's not rebuking. He's reaffirming, but I also think he's reorienting. And he's warning Peter and his disciples and us through this parable of the danger of wrong motive, the dangers of a calculating spirit, a comparing spirit, a comparing spirit, and a complaining spirit. Let me draw that out of the parable very quickly. What I call in the Lord's service, the danger of a calculating spirit. It's interesting within the story, we've already alluded to this, there are two kinds of workers in the story, right? In verses 1 to 2, there's the, wor the workers who work according to a contract. And then in verses 3 to 4, there are those who are hired uh, who, who, have, who trust the master to do what's right. And, and those who signed up for the denarius a day, when, when they watch others getting the same, well, they're not happy. They're, they're, they're running the figures in their head. There's something wrong with this. This doesn't compute. I, I don't like this calculation. How do we who worked all day in the heat of the day and put in 12 hours hard work, how do we come up short compared to those who came for one hour at five o'clock and got the same? So, so they're calculating. They're negotiating. They're kind of um, haggling and bargaining to some degree, um, with, with the owner. The first group bargained, haggled, not the second group. They were just happy for the opportunity, and they trusted the master of the vineyard. We don't need, need to spend a ton of time on this. It's, it's very simple that we've got to watch a calculating spirit. Now, now again, there's a sense in which we can think through and add up in our minds the reward and the glory that awaits the faithful servant. But if we're not careful, it can lead to a pred quo pro kind of approach to the Christian life, where we start to kind of bargain with God. Well, Lord, if I do this, I believe you're going to do that. And it becomes commercial and contractual. And we lose something of the heart and we begin to haggle with God. We've got to guard against the spirit of a harling. We're not just to punch the clock in the kingdom of God. We've got to be careful not to serve the Lord in a manner that seems to put him in our debt. I, I, I like what um, Erwin Lutzer in his book on eternal reward says about this very chapter in this very point. He said this, I've heard Christians say, I promised God that if he gave me a better job, I would begin to tithe. That's, that's, the commercial spirit. That's the calculating spirit. If God doesn't, if God doesn't call me to Africa, I, I, I will get a good job and support 10 missionaries. Such bargains ties the hands of God, and He cannot be generous with us. We, we must not try to make a deal with the Almighty. We should simply serve Him to the best of our ability and let Him worry about the results. We must seek His will and trust Him to do what's right by us. I like that. 
Again, Peter's not wrong. God, aren't you going to reward us for all of our sacrifices? Yes. But what is, is right could become wrong in terms of you, be, you become calculating and you lose something simply of the free grace of God and the joy of serving Him and just, you know what, Lord? Heaven's enough, but I know there's going to be more than that. And I'm just going to trust you with that and I'm going to serve you and I'm going to sacrifice you and I'm going to gladly give my stuff away and do your glory. Do your kingdom work for, for your glory because you can be trusted Luther goes on, when we make a bargain with God, stipulating he do, he do business on our terms, we lose. He will be more gracious when we realize, more gracious when we realize that he alone has the right to make the choice about our rewards. He invites us to rejoice in his promise that he will be, that we will be rewarded, but we must determine what that reward will be. But he must determine what that reward will be. And with his decision, we shall be satisfied. I remember years ago reading a little story about a, 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 in the early days of American history when people were out on the plains and they would make a weekly trip back into the nearest little town where the general store. And so this farmer and his wife and the kids get into their wagon and they make the half a day trip to the, the little town and they, he's in the store again and the wife's in the store getting the necessities, the essentials. And their little son is standing by the counter and these, there's these jars of hard candy lollipops and gobstoppers. And the, and the shop owner sees this, and the little face says, hey, you know, put your hand in one of the jars and take what you want. And he stands there just looking, kind of coming across a little bit shy. And so the, the, the owner drops his hand in and uh, gives him a, a handful of, of candy. And on the way home, the father who watched all of that says, hey, I, I, I saw what was going on in there, and I was a little surprised. You're not typically behind the door. You're not shy to, to, to take what you think uh, can be yours. So, so why didn't you put your hand into the jar when the store owner told you to, to which the little rough fella replied, well, his hand is bigger than mine. <laughs> and I love that story because I try to remind myself when I have a calculating spirit that God's hand is always bigger than mine. You're listening to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy, a message titled More Than Compensated. To revisit today's lesson, visit ktt.org. There on our website, you'll also find information on how you can be part of the team as a truth ambassador, a special partner who gives monthly to Know the Truth. These valued members of our ministry give a monthly automated gift to help us continue sharing God's Word through the radio and Internet. And in turn, they receive exclusive benefits and resources. This month, you'll receive a welcome package full of great resources, as well as a copy of The Parables, Understanding What Jesus Meant by Gary Inrig. To sign up to give monthly or give a one-time gift of any amount, call 888-644-8811 or visit ktt.org. Hey, as we end this week and head into the next, remember, God's mercies are new every morning. Whatever you have faced or will face, His love is constant and His compassions they feel not. I love Lamentations 3.22, which I just echoed, but it says this also, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. How encouraging. Let's step into the next week with hope, grounded in God's Word and its great and exceeding promises. If you need prayer or encouragement, reach out to us at 888-644-8811 or visit ktt.org. Until next time, know the truth and let it transform your life. Thank you, Philip. I'm Wayne Shepherd. Join us next time for another edition of Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Mm -hmm.